his weapons. Therefore, to heighten Hygelic's fame and gladden his heart, I hereby renounce sword and the shelter of the broad shield. The heavy war bound hand to hand is how it will be, a life and death fight with the fiend. Whichever one death fall, fells must deem it a just judgment by God. If Grendel wins, it will be a gruesome day. He will glut himself on the geats in the war hall, soup without fear on that flower of manhood as on others before. Then my face won't be there to be covered in death. He will carry me away as he goes to ground, gorged and bloodied. He will run loading with my raw corpse and feed, it, feed on it alone, in a cruel frenzy, fouling his moor nest. No need then to lament for long or lay out my body. If the battle takes me, send back this beast webbing, this breast webbing that Welland fashioned and Hrethel gave me. The Lord Hyjlak, fate goes ever as fate must. Hrothgar, the helmet of shield, spoke. Beowulf, my friend, you have traveled here to favor us with help and to fight for us. <clears throat> there was a feud one time, began by your father. With his own hands he had killed he Heathaloth, who was a wolfing. So far was looming, and his people, in fear of it, forced him to leave. He came away then, over rolling waves, to the South Danes here, the Sons of Honor. I was then in the first flush of kingship, established my sway over the rich strongholds of this heroic land. Herogar, my older brother and the better man, also a son of half Danes, had died. Finally, I healed the feud by pain. I shipped a treasure trove to the Wolfings, and the Ekthau acknowledged me with oaths of allegiance. It bothers me to have to burden anyone with all the grief that Grendel has caused and the havoc he has wreaked upon us and Herot, our humiliations. My household guard are on the wane. Fate sweeps them away into Grendel's clutches, but God can easily halt these raids and harrowing attacks. Time and again when the goblets passed and seasoned fighters got flushed with beer, they would pledge themselves to protect Herot and wait for Grendel with their wedded swords. But when dawn broke and day crept in over each empty, blood-spattered bench, the floor of the mead hall where they had feasted would be slick, slick with slaughter. And so they died, faithful retainers, and my following dwindled. Now take your place at the table, relish the triumph of heroes to your heart's content. Feast at Herot. Then a bench was cleared in that banquet hall, so that so the Geats could have room to be together, and the party sat proud in their bearing, strong and stalwart. An attendant stood by with a decorated pitcher, pouring bright helpings of mead, and the minstrel sang, filling Herot with his head-clearing voice. Glad in that great rally of Dane, great Geats and Danes, gladdening that great rally of Geats and Danes. From where he crouched at the king's feet, Unferth, the son of Eklafs, spoke contrary words. Beowulf's coming, his sea braving, made him sick with envy. He could not brook or abide the fact that anyone else alive under heaven might enjoy greater regard than he did. Are you the Beowulf who took on Brekka in a swimming match on the open sea, risking the water just to prove that you could win? It was sheer vanity made you venture out on the main deep, and no matter who tried, friend or foe, to deflect the pain of you, neither would back down. The sea test ob obsessed you. You waded in embracing water, taking its measure, mastering currents, riding on the swell. The ocean swayed, winter went wild in the waves, but you vied for seven nights, and then he outswam you, came ashore the stronger contender. He was cast up safe and sound one morning among the Heatho reams, then made his way to where he belonged in Brondon country, home again, sure of his ground. 
in strong room and bond. So Brecca made good his boast upon you and was proved right. No matter, therefore, how you may have fared in every bout and battle until now, this time you'll be worsted. No one has ever outlasted an entire night against Grendel. Beowulf, Ecthau's son, replied, Well, friend Unferth, you have had your say about Brecca and me, but it was mostly beer that was doing the talking. The truth is this, when, he, when the going was heavy in those high waves, I was the strongest swimmer of all. We'd been children together and we grew up, daring ourselves to outdo each other, boasting and urging each other to risk our lives on the sea. And so it turned out, each of us swam holding a sword, a naked, hard-proofed blade for protection against the whale beasts. Rebecca could never move out farther or faster from me than I could manage to move from him. Shoulder to shoulder, we struggled on for five nights until the long flow and pitch of the waves, the perishing cold night following the winds from the north, drove us apart. The deep boiled up, and its wallowing scents the sea brutes wild. My armor helped me to hold out, my hard ring chain mail, hand forged and linked, a fine, close fitting filigree of gold, kept me safe when some ocean creature pulled me to the bottom. Pinioned fast and swathed in its grip, I was granted one final chance. My sword plunged, and the ordeal was over. Through my hands, the fury of battle had finished off the sea beast. Time and again, foul things attacked me, lurking and stalking, but I lashed out, gave as good as I got with my sword. My flesh was not for feasting on. There would be no monsters gnawing and gloating over their banquet at the bottom of the sea. Instead, in the morning, mangled and sleeping, the sea of the, the sleep of the sword, they slopped and floated like the ocean's leavings. <laughs> From now on, sailors would be safe from deep sea raids were over for good. Light came from the east, bright guarantee of God, and the waves went quiet. I could see headlands and buffeted cliffs. Often for undaunted courage, fate spares the man it has not already marked. Whoever it occurred, my sword had killed nine sea monsters. Such night dangers and hard ordeals I had never heard of, nor... A man were desolate and surging waves. But worn out as I was, I survived, came through with my life. The ocean lifted and laid me ashore. I landed safe on the coast of Finland. Now I cannot recall any fight you entered on Firth that bears comparison. I don't boast when I say that neither you nor Brecco were ever much celebrated for swordsmanship or for facing danger on the field of battle. You killed your own kith and kin, so for all your cleverness and quick tongue, you will suffer damnation in the depths of hell. The fact is, Unferth, if you were truly as keen or courageous as you claim to be, Grendel would never have gotten away with such unchecked atrocity. Attacks on your king, havoc and herot, and horrors everywhere. But he knows he need never be in dread of your blade making a mizzle of his blood, or a vengeance arriving ever from this quarter. From the victory shieldings, the shoulder, shoulders of the spear, he knows he can trample down your Danes to his heart's content, humiliate and murder without fear of reprisal, but he will find me different. I will show him how Geats shape to kill in the heat of a battle, in the heat of battle. Then whoever wants to, wants to may go bravely to mead when the morning light, scarfed and sun dazzle, shines forth from the south and brings another daybreak to the world. Then the gray-haired treasure-giver was glad. Far famed in battle, the prince of bright Danes and keeper of his people counted on Beowulf, on the warrior's steadfastness and his word. So the laughter started, the din got louder, and the crowd was happy. Wealthau came in, Hrothgar's queen, observing the courtesies. Adorned in her gold, she graciously saluted the men in the hall, and handed the cup, the fir first to Hrothgar, their homeland's guardian, urging him to drink deep and enjoy it, because he was dear to them. And he drank it down like the warlord he was, was with festive cheer. So the helming woman went on her rounds, queenly and dignified, decked out in rings, offering the goblet to all ranks, treating the household and the assembled troop until it was Beowulf's turn to take it from her hand. With measured words she welcomed the Geat, and thanked God for granting her wish. 
that deliverer she could believe in would arrive to ease their afflictions. He accepted the cup, a daunting man, dangerous in action, and eager for it always. He addressed Wilhethio, Wheel, Beowulf, son of Ecthau, said, I had a fixed purpose when I put to sea, as I sat in the boat with my band of men. I meant to perform the, to the uttermost what your people wanted to perish in the attempt, in the fiend's clutches. What what your people wanted, or perish in the attempt, in the fiend's clutches. And I shall fulfill that purpose, prove myself with a proud deed, or meet my death here in the Mead Hall. This formal beast by Beowulf, the great the Geet, pleased the lady well, and she went to sit by Hrothgar, regal and arrayed with gold. Then it was like old times in the echoing hall, proud talk and the people happy, loud and excited, until soon enough half Dane's heir had to be away to his night's rest. He realized that the demon was going to descend on the hall, that he had plotted all day from dawnlight until darkness gathered again over the world, and steth stealthy night shapes came stealing forth under the cloud murk. The company stood as the two leaders took leave of each other. Hrothgar wished Beowulf health and good luck, named him Hallward, and announced as follows. Never since my hand could hold a shield have I entrusted or given control of the Danes' hall to anyone but you. Ward and guard it, for it is the greatest of houses. Be on your mettle now, keep, your mi keep in mind your fame, be aware, beware of the enemy. There's nothing you wish for that won't be yours if you win through alive. fight with Grendel. Hrothgar departed, then his house guard. Hrothgar departed with his house guard. The Lord of the Shieldings, their shelter in war, led the Mead Hall to lie with Gwelthiao, his queen and bedmate. The King of Glory, as people learned, had posted a lookout who was a match for Grendel, a guard against monsters, special protection to the Danish prince. When the Geat placed complete trust in his strength of limb in the Lord's favor, he began to remove his iron breast mail, took off the helmet and handed his attendant the patterned sword, a smith's masterpiece, ordering him to keep the equipment guarded. And before he bedded down, Beowulf, that prince of goodness, proudly asserted, when it comes to fighting, I count myself as dangerous any day as Grendel, so it won't be a cutting edge I'll wield to mow him down, easily as I might. He has no idea of the arts of war, of shield or sword play, although he does possess a wild strength. No weapons, therefore, for either this night. Unarmed he shall face me, if face me he dares. And may the Divine Lord, in his wisdom, grant the glory of victory to whichever side he sees fit. Then down the brave man lay with his bolster, under his head and his whole, whole company, the sea rovers and rest beside him. None of them expected he would ever see his homeland again or get back to his native place and the people who reared him. They knew too well the way it was before, how often the Danes had fallen prey to death in the Mead Hall, but the Lord was weaving a victory on his war, war loom for the weather, weather geats. Weather geats. Through the strength of one they all prevailed. They would crush their enemy and come through in triumph and gladness. The truth is clear. Almighty God has rules over mankind and always has. Then out of the night came the Shadow Stalker, stealthy and swift. The hall guards were slack, asleep at their posts, all except one. It was widely understood that as long as God disallowed it, the fiend could not bear them to his shadow born. One man, however, was in fighting mood, awake and on edge, spoiling for action. In off the moors, down through the mist bends, God cursed Grendel, came greedily lopping. The bane of the race of men roamed forth, hunting for a prey in the night hall. 
Under the cloud murk he moved toward it, until it shone above him, a sheer keep of fortified gold. Nor was that the first time he had scouted the grounds of Hrothgar's dwelling, although never in his life before or since did he find harder fortune or hall defenders. Spurred and, jo spurned and joyless, he journeyed on ahead and arrived at the bond. The iron brace door turned on its hinge when his hands touched it. Then his rage boiled over. He ripped open the mouth of the building, maddening for blood, pacing the length of the patterned floor with his lonesome tread, while a baleful light, flame more than light, flared from his eyes. He saw many men in the mansion, sleeping, a ranked company of kinsmen and warriors quartered together, and his glee was demonic, picturing the mayhem. Before morning he would rip limb from limb and devour them, feed on their flesh, but his fate that night was due to change. His days of ravening had come to an end. Mighty and canny, Hyglek's kinsman, Hyglek's kinsman was keenly watching for the first move the monster would make. Nor did the creature keep him waiting, but struck suddenly and started in. He grabbed him all the man on his bench, bit into his bone lappings, bolted down his blood and gorged on him in lumps, leaving the body utterly lifeless, eaten up, hand and foot. Venturing closer, his talon was raised to attack Beowulf, where he lay on the bed. He was bearing in with open claw when the alert hero's comeback and arm lock forestalled him utterly. The captain of evil discovered himself in a hand grip harder than anything he had ever encountered in any man on the face of earth. Every bone in his body quailed and recoiled, but he could not escape. He was desperate to flee his den and hide with the devil's litter, for in all his days he had never been clamped or cornered like this. Then Heislick's trusty retainer recalled his bedtime speech, sprang to his feet, and got a firm hold. Fingers were bursting, the monster backtracking, the man overpowering. The dread of the land was desperate to escape, take a roundabout road and flee to his lair in the fens. The latching power in his fingers weakened. It was the worst trip the terror monger had, er had taken to Herat. And now the timbers trembled and sang, a hall session that harrowed every Dane. Inside the stockade, stumbling in fury, the two contenders crashed through the building. The hall clattered and hammered, but somehow survived the onslaught and kept standing. It was handsomely structured, a sturdy frame, braced with the best of blacksmith's work, inside and out. The story goes that as the pair struggled, mead benches were smashed and sprung off the floor, gold fittings and all. Before then, no shielding edge, elder, would believe there was any power or person upon earth capable of wrecking their horn-rigged hall unless the burning embrace of a fire engulf it in flame. Then an extraordinary wail arose and bewildering fear came over the Danes. Everyone felt it, who heard that cry as it echoed off the wall. A god-cursed scream and strain of catastrophe. The howl of the loser, the lament of the hell surf, keening his wound. He was overwhelmed, manacled tight by the man who, of all men, was foremost and strongest in the days of his life. In the days of this life. But the Earl Troop's leader was not inclined to allow his caller to depart alive. He did not consider that life of much account to anyone anywhere. Time and again, Beowulf's warriors worked to defend their lord's life, laying about them as best they could with their ancestral blades. Stalwart in action, they kept striking out on every side, seeking to cut straight to the soul. When they joined the struggle, there was something they could not have known at the time, that no blade on earth, no blacksmith's art, could ever damage their demon's opponent their demon opponent. He had conjured the harm from the cutting edge of every weapon, but his going away out of this world and the days of his life would be agony to him, and his alien spirit would travel far into fiend's keeping. Then he who had harrowed the hearts of men with pain and affliction in former times, and had given offense also to God, found that his bodily powers failed him, Heislek's king kinsman kept him helplessly locked in a hand grip. As long as either lived, he was as he was hateful to the other. 
The monster's whole body was in pain. A tremendous wound appeared on his shoulders. Sinews split and the bone lappings burst. Beowulf was granted the glory of winning. Grendel was driven under the fen banks fatally hurt to his desolate lair. His days were numbered. The end of his life was coming over him. He knew it for certain, and one bloody clash had fulfilled the dearest wishes of the Danes. The man who had lately landed among them, proud and sure, had purged the hall, kept it from harm. He was happy with his night work and the courage he had, he had shown. The geek captain had boldly fulfilled his boast to the Danes. He had healed and relieved huge distress, unremitting humiliations, the hard fate they'd been forced to undergo, no small affliction. Clear proof of this could be seen in the hand of he in the hand the hero displayed high up near the roof, the whole of Grendel's shoulder and arm, his awesome grasp. Celebration at Herat. Then morning came, and many a warrior gathered, as I've heard, around the gift hall. Clan chiefs flocking from far and near down wide-ranging roads, wondering greatly at the monster's, at the monster's footprints. His fatal departure was regretted by no one who witnessed his trail, the ignominious marks of his flight. The ignominious... The ig, the ignominious the ignominious marks of his flight, where he'd skulked away, exhausted in spirit, and beaten in battle, bloodying the path, hauled his doom to the demon's mirror. The bloodshot water wallowed and surged. There were loathsome upthrows and, overturn and overturnings of waves and gore and wound slurry. With his death upon him, he had di dived deep into his marsh den, drowned out his life, and his heathen soul. Hell claimed him there. Then away they rode, the old retainers, with many a young man following after, a troop on horseback and high spirits on their bay steeds. Beowulf's doings were praised over and over again. Nowhere they said north or south between the two seas or under the tall sky on the broad earth was there anyone better to raise a shield or to rule a kingdom. Yet there was no laying of blame on their lord, the noble Hrothgar. He was a good king. At times the war band broke into a gallop, letting their chestnut horse, horses race wherever they found the going good on those well-known tracks. Meanwhile, a thane of the king's household, a carrier of tales, a traditional singer deeply schooled in the lore of the past, linked a new theme to a strict meter. The man started to recite with skill, rehearsing Beowulf's triumphs and feats in well-fashioned lines and twining his words. He told what he'd heard, repeating in songs of Sigma.